Yeah, our speaker is Dr. Randy Wells. Uh, Randy is a behavioral ecologist with the Chicago Zoological Society, and Randy is based at Moat Marine Lab. Randy received a master's degree uh, quite some years ago um, at the University of Florida and subsequently a PhD from the U University of California at Santa Cruz. He also, after his PhD, did some postdoctoral uh, work at Woods Hole in uh, Oceanographic Institute. Um, Randy is probably most well known for the fact that he has um, must, it must be the longest running um, research program on a particular population of cetaceans for sure, and maybe uh, could be uh, close to setting a record for any uh, marine mammal and maybe even terrestrial mammal. Um, uh, again, many of you will know that Randy was past president of the Society for Marine Mammalogy. He currently serves as a scientific advisor to the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission, um, and he has been doing so for several years. He's served, um, is currently serving as an editor um, for Marine Mammal Science, and again, has been doing that for several years. I don't know that we could manage without Randy being in that uh, uh, position. He gets a lot of papers to uh, handle. And last but not least, and in fact, perhaps most impressive, Randy has been um, awarded the Society for Marine Mammology's Distinguished Kenneth S. Norris Lifetime Achievement Award. And Randy will be giving a presentation at the Society's biennial meeting um, as a result of having received that uh, award. And uh, we, we hope we'll see a, a paper based on that in marine mammal science uh, subsequently. So today's presentation, however, will not be about Randy's long-term work with uh, Sarasota Bay bottlenose dolphins, but rather he'll be telling us about some work with Franciscana dolphins off Argentina and Brazil. This is a species that is the most endangered small cetacean species in southwestern, the southwestern Atlantic. Um, specifically, uh, Randy's talk will be on ranging patterns and behavior of these dolphins um, based on tag, uh, data from tagged animals. The presentation is a paper that uh, was just out in the um, April issue of Marine Mammal Science. And we ha we'll have a slightly different Q&A format um, for this presentation. Randy will have um, some of his co-authors join him in a panel um, to answer and, and handle questions. So I'll uh, leave it to Aunt, uh, Randy to introduce um, those members uh, and co-authors on his paper at the end of his talk. So with that, Randy, we look forward to your presentation. Take it away. Thank you very much, Daryl. You're, you're much too kind. And just to be, be clear about it, I did not vote for myself for, as a member of the, the Board of Editors to give this talk. Um, all right. So I'm here today representing a lot of different people. The work in Argentina and Brazil that we've done over uh, quite a long period of time involved many, many people, far too numerous to name individually, although most of them are listed in our publication. But I'll be representing the team and um, hopefully we'll have the uh, panelists being the subject experts on Franciscanas. I am not by any means an expert on Franciscanas, but I'm, I'm here to share some of the information that we have found. And then we can go into it in more detail with the real experts once we do the, the Q&A. So let's see if I can bring this up. So I'm, I'm here representing a group of people, quite a large team of folks, and many of those have are able to join me as panelists to answer the questions as Daryl indicated. Among the most important of the people that was unable to be with us, Pablo Bordino is the person who got us started with this research program. Pablo began his work with Franciscana dolphins back in the 1990s, and unfortunately he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was able to introduce a lot of people to the issues that Franciscana's face and introduce a lot of different research that helped to direct management in directions that would reduce the amount of take of these animals along the coast of Argentina and elsewhere. So we 
dedicate this talk to Pablo and I very much miss him as we move forward with the, the work that he got started. So a little bit of basics about the animals themselves. First of all, they're among the smallest of the cetaceans. The largest ones get to about 177 centimeters. Females get to be larger than males. They don't live very long. There are very few that make it more than 10 years, but they do live up to 21 years. They're found only in the coastal waters of Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil, in a very narrow strip right along the coastline and the, the brown area shown here in waters less than 50 meters deep, typically. In 2003, there were four Franciscana management areas that were proposed. Um, FM4, Franciscana management area four down here is all of Argentina. The IUCN red list status considers these animals to be vulnerable and the populations are declining. And this is due especially to fishing and gill nets, artisanal gill net fishing especially, and habitat degradation. And finally, there's a, not a lot known about the behavior of the animals. There's more known than there was when we started our project. Certainly a lot of people have gotten into different modes of observing them in the field. But as we started the project, there was very little known about behavior because of their small body size, because they have a very small dorsal fin. They have small groups, they're cryptic, their body color is just about the same as that of the waters and the estuaries where they, and the coastlines where they live. They don't engage in much in the way of aerial behavior and they have few natural markings. All that makes it challenging to learn about these animals in the wild. So in the early 2000s, Pablo Bordino wanted to expand his abilities to learn about their behavior. And he came to us and began talking about the possibilities of doing tagging and tracking of the animals. The problem that he noted for Argentina was that Franciscana dolphins are subjected to unaccept unacceptably high rates of bycatch within the limited range of the species. The approach for managing them requires identification of management units and evaluation of risks to specifically defined stocks. The Franciscana management area is a pretty large area and difficult to manage. The implicit hull null hypothesis with the FMA system is that Franciscanas range widely along the coast of Argentina, but that was not known. So the objective of the project was to provide information regarding movement patterns, home ranges, and via tagging and behavior via tagging and tracking. So we had a number of considerations as we developed an approach for this. First of all, could Franciscanas be caught safely and tagged? Could we, how could we maximize the chances for success? We wanted to use a safe and well-tested technique. So we chose the encircling seine net that we've used and others have used with um, other dolphins like bottlenose dolphins. That's deployed in shallow water. And this was our first choice. We made a site visit in 2003 to Argentina and determined that Franciscanas use sufficiently shallow and suitable waters in some portions of the range for this technique to work. Recognizing the small size of the animals, we scaled down the size and the weight of the net from what we use for bottomless dolphins. We want the dolphins to be able to lift the net to the surface to breathe, if at all possible. We also wanted to use the smallest tag that was available for our pilot study, and this was a VHF transmitter that we could track from shore, from a lighthouse, building roofs, and, and that sort of thing. As part of the process, we wanted to train the Argentinians to be the primary members of the, the uh, tagging team. So we brought their core team to Sarasota for training in 2004, where they participated in one of our bottomless dolphin health assessment projects. And they brought along the person that would be doing their dolphin catching, their net deployment. We then took an experienced team from our group in Sarasota to Argentina the next year to help with the pilot study, including our catcher. And then a few years later, in response to a request from Marta Kramer in Brazil, we used the same approach and then took a tri-national team, Argentina, Brazil, and the U.S. to the field in Brazil. So a little bit about our study area. We worked in three different sites. We started out in Bahia, Samborombom, Argentina down here and did tagging during three years. During the middle of that time, we also went down to Bahia San Blas, farther south in Argentina, deployed more tags there. And then in 2011 and 13, we went to Bahia de Bobitonga in southern Brazil and put out additional tags in that area. A little bit about the habitat in each of these areas. In Bahia San Borombom, where we started out, it's primarily an open bay, but there are sandbanks around the inside of the bay near the shoreline. 
when the overall depth is up to 12 meters, most of the waters are much more shallow in this area, and there wasn't a huge tidal excursion. Farther to the south, there were different kinds of habitats. It was more complex. There were islands and sandbanks in this area, along with deep channels that ranged down to 25 meters and a bigger tidal excursion of up to about three meters. There also were predators in this area. There were killer whales, and it's also the shark fishing capital of Argentina. So it made life a little bit more challenging. In Bahia de Bobitonga in Brazil, it was a very, very different situation. We were working in a very enclosed bay. The only entrance to the bay was a very narrow entrance to the Atlantic Ocean here. And then that went past San Francisco do Sur where there's a large uh, facility, large harbor facilities for, for big ships. And then our work with the Franciscanos was down in this corner of the bay where they spent the vast majority of the time based on photo identification studies. And there were good shallow banks there to be able to work. There was also another species of cetacean in the area. So Italia also inhabits the waters, but there's minimal overlap between the two species. So the, the process we used was very similar to what we used with bottlenose dolphins. We used a seine net that was about 500 meters long and four and a half meters deep. We set it in shallow water, less than three meters deep, especially on the sandbanks. We had multiple boats, 40 people, an experienced fisherman to set the net, and at least two veterinarians. Once we found dolphins in the right place, Luis would set the net, would get a net circle around the area. We would put our personnel around the outside of the net to be able to come to the aid of dolphins should they entangle in the net. We would then bring them aboard a small boat where they would go on a padded deck. Our veterinarian would listen to the heart rate of the animal and keep his eyes on the animal and its overall behavior, take a blood sample. We'd get measurements. We would attach a tag to the animal and then release the animal over the side to a, a receiving team and then let it go from that site. Overall, we captured 27 dolphins, put out 26 electronic tags of these. Um, to, um, many of them were satellite linked, only three of them were not. Among the most important lessons that we learned was confirmation that Franciscanas required great care and brevity in handling. In most cases, the tag dolphin responded reasonably well to brief handling, and they swam off strongly upon release and were subsequently tracked for days to months. On average, we had animals from the time the net went out to the time they were released for about 32 minutes. They were on board the tagging boat for about 6.6 .6 minutes. And if we were just doing tagging, they were that only required about five minutes. So we tried to keep things as brief as we could. That said, our recommendations for subsequent work is that we set the net on no more than three dolphins at a time and be certain of the numbers present before setting and making sure to avoid calves. The net should be removed from the water entirely and as quickly as possible once the dolphins are restrained. Net remaining in the water can and has entangled dolphins. We want to minimize the handling time, bring them aboard the tagging boat, complete the tagging and sampling, and return them to a receiving team as quickly as possible, ideally in less than 10 minutes. Doing all of this successfully results in the successful tagging and tracking of Franciscana dolphins. The tags that we used were uh, beyond the VHF tags on the pilot study were wildlife computer satellite link tags. They were either location only or location and dive data tags. And we used a variety of tags over the years as they evolved. There were concurrent projects going on in the US with bottlenose dolphins and other dolphins in other places. And Wildlife Computers was responsive to input from the field biologists on how the tags might be improved. The early tags were side mount tags attached with three separate pins. And as time went on, we learned that, that these, pin, these tags had problems in terms of how much of the fin surface they covered and the potential for damage from pin migration should one or more tag pins come out. We moved towards a single pin attachment. And these evolved in time so that by the last year, by 2013, we were working with a much more streamlined version with a different coating and with much better features for maintaining it without potential for harm to the animals. We were able to track animals for as long as 258 days with one of these tags, but the most recent version that we used, we were able to track for 191 days, which is very good for being able to get data across multiple seasons. Our pilot study was in Bahia Samborambal. We worked from the lighthouse and from shoreline. We learned that it was feasible to do the capture work and 
we were limited with what we could find out by doing the radio tracking because it only gave us bearing. So we could on occasion triangulate, but typically all we knew was that the dolphins were out here. Well, we knew the dolphins were out here a lot. They weren't going elsewhere. And so that gave us our first, our first hints of residency for these individuals. When we came back in 2006, we brought with us satellite linked transmitters and applied those to four dolphins in um, Bahia Sambombom. These maps will be the same from one slide to another. This is Bahia Sambombom during 2006, during 2010. The representations are all of the high quality locations in the upper image and then the, uh, the home range in general and the core area within that home range in the lower image. So for these figures, we use only those locations, the high quality locations where there is an estimated error radius and that error radius is up to 1500 meters. So it's only the, the data for which we have the greatest confidence that we used in these analyses. So what this shows is that the dolphins remained very close to their capture sites shown by the crosses in these, in these images. They didn't move very far at all, and they were consistent in this lack of movement across individuals within a year and across years. They had slightly different patterns in terms of how much they used inside the bay versus along the coastline, but they all met over these shallow sandbanks at the mouth of Bayas on Borombon. And so here is the compiled information for all the dolphins we tagged in San Borombon. Going down to Bahia San Blas with similar images, we show again that the animals were very true to the locations where we caught them for tagging. They used these areas extensively inside the bay near the shallow sandbanks where we caught them, but they also moved out into the offshore waters to a certain extent as well. These are the four dolphins from 2007, and these are the four from 2008. And they used the coastal waters to a, a greater extent, and they had larger ranges, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the patterns were again consistent across individuals within years and across years as well. They were not ranging very far over the months that we were able to tr track them in most cases. And what we found was that for the dolphins in Bahia San Blas, San Blas, many of them were within a marine protected area, which helps out a great deal in terms of management options. So up in Bahia Babatonga in Brazil, it was a very, very different situation. It was a small bay to start out with and the dolphins used a very small portion of that bay and they were very consistent. You could look across almost the entire range of the animals on any given day and see scattered Franciscanas through the area. The patterns were similar across individuals within 2011 and from 2011 to 2013. And here's the compiled uh, location data for these animals in this upper portion of the bay, away from the, the harbor region over here and away from the entrance going out to the Atlantic Ocean. There are two outlier locations for Carijo over here. And when we ran this through the Douglas plausibility filter, both of them dropped out from further consideration. So as a comparison across these locations, what we find is a high degree of variability. They all showed site fidelity over the period of time that we were able to observe them, which was a period of months typically. And subsequent work and by Babitonga especially has shown through photo ID work that the animals can be resident and are resident over periods of years. But the home range size for Bayeta Babitonga was very small, 6.4 kilometers. I'm not aware of another species of dolphin that has a range that small. Bahia Samborombom was intermediate with 132 square kilometers, but then San Blas had very large home range at 463 uh, square kilometers. And we suspect that the variation in here has a lot to do with the different kinds of prey available at each of the sites. And in particular in Bahia de Mabitonga, the limitations might be due to the human activities that push the animals potentially over into one part of the bay as opposed to giving them access to the entire bay with all the shipping activity. We were able to look at behavior in a variety of ways. One of those ways was looking at the movements of the dolphins relative to tides. And what we found was that in Bahia Babatonga, there was a muted response to the tides and movements with the tides, but it was more marked at the other two bays in Argentina. And what we find is the dolphins move with the tides. In these representations, we're looking at longitude in the upper 
set of graphs across each site. And with the westernmost locations being down here and the easternmost up here. And in the bottom, we're looking at latitude with the southernmost down here and the northernmost up here. And so in the bays in Argentina, what we find is going through the tide cycles, the first part of the ebb, the second half of the ebb, low tide, first part of the flood cycle, second part of the flood cycle. As the animals, as the waters get towards low tide, the animals are moving to the east and to the south. And this is to the mouth of each of the bays. And then as the waters come back in, the animals move inside the bays and go farther to the west and to the north. So they are clearly moving with the tides in these areas, potentially in response to the prey that, they're, that are there as well. But we don't know this for certain. Looking also at the use of the habitat by these individuals, we find that, that when we look at where the satellite link locations put the animals relative to the depth at those areas, in some bone bone, the vast majority of the locations were in waters less than five meters deep. In San Blas, it was uh, peaking right around five meters with a little bit more um, expansion into other depth ranges all the way out to the deepest waters in the area. In Abaya Babatonga, it was again centered on about five meters with use of deeper waters, but primarily using, primarily being in waters that are, are more shallow. Taking a look at the time at depth data from the tags that were put out in those areas, we find that, that they use these shallow water areas and, and stay at fairly shallow depths to the, to the greatest extent, but where the water depths do get to be deeper, they will use those deeper waters. The evidence here suggests that these animals are using the entire water column, not just the surface or the midwaters, but actually going down and making use of the bottom waters as well. We set it up in Bahia San Blas to look at the social patterns of these animals. We set the duty cycles to be identical for the four animals that we tagged in 2008 in Bahia San Blas, and we released them and then kept track of them for the next few months. And what we found was a, a bit surprising for us, being familiar with other kinds of, of small cetaceans. What we found was that in the case of unrelated adult males and adult females, there were two situations that occurred. In this case, with Kona and Nahuel, they spent a great deal of time together after they were released. And even when they separated, they came back together again and spent extended time periods together. With Curry and Tunkan, it was even more dramatic. They stayed together most of the time um, following release. So adult males and adult females living together for extended periods of time is foreign to what we know from most of the small cetaceans. And if we look at, at bottlenose dolphins in contrast, this is a situation with three adult females during the season of their receptivity and the calves that were born from these, these um, interactions with males. But during the two months surrounding the period of conception, there's a long list of suitors that each of these females was exposed to. She selected one of them, or she mated with one of them, and the same with FB90 and FB125. Again, many different males that they interacted with. And among that list of males was the one that ultimately sired the calves that were produced. But very different from the, the uh, single associations that we were seeing for the, the Franciscanas. We also had the opportunity to look at the uh, tags and how they uh, worked on these animals and get some hints about how to improve them, especially for our small animals such as Franciscanas. Especially in Bahia de Babitonga, there was the opportunity for Marta and her colleagues to go out and look at these animals as part of regular photo ID tracking and keep tabs on the tags. In the early stages of putting tags on these animals in Sarasota and elsewhere, as well as in Argentina, we noted that there would be attachment pin migration. It would migrate through the the fin and leave a notch in some cases. The antennas would break from time to time. And you would collect biofouling if the tag was on long enough with um, algae and barnacles that would affect the functioning of the tag and add to the drag of the tag and probably also lead to the, to the loss of the tag ultimately. We did a major redesign that I mentioned for 2013 in which the tag was more streamlined. We used new materials. And with this, we 
got 191 days of tracking from this particular individual, and the tag stayed on for more than 300 days. We had reduced biofouling, and when the tag came off the fin, it released the way it was supposed to. The corrosible screw that was holding it into a plastic pin corroded, the tag fell off and left a tiny hole that healed up. Since that time, we've been moving to continue to improve the tags, working closely with wildlife computers, and we have versions that are now smaller. We have an anti-fouling coating that we use on a regular basis. They've changed the material in the sensors to also discourage fouling of the sensors. We've added protection to the antenna base, so animals rubbing on the bottom or interacting with one another will have less of a chance of being able to break the antenna. And we've made the attachment to the pin to the fin more flexible as well. So all these improvements are benefiting our tracking efforts in a, in a variety of places. So to summarize, in terms of the contributions that this work has been making towards uh, conservation, tracking photo ID and genetic data have helped to refine Franciscana management areas, contributing to the subdivision of all three study bays into more biologically meaningful and focused management units. In Argentina, where the bycatch is the primary threat to Franciscanos, we found that the research itself had a positive impact on some of the fishermen helping with the project, leading to some of them being willing to participate in experiments with alternative fishing gear to try to reduce the Franciscana mortalities. In Brazil, the tracking data are playing an important role by clearly defining the Franciscanos living area in Bahia Babatongo for decision-making to evaluate the viability of the new harbors under consideration. Also in Bahia Babatonga, the small home range size reaches an extreme. Telemetry findings support the idea that this population is isolated from Franciscanas in the adjacent Atlantic Ocean coastal zone, which is about 20 kilometers away. Kuna et al. 2020 suggests that the gene flow was probably impacted by human activities, especially associated with the harbor development and use, perhaps causing the Franciscanas to gradually avoid the access channel and reducing their contact with the adjacent Atlantic coastal area. These characteristics make this Bahia Babitonga population unique and it indicates an extreme degree of vulnerability which should be considered in their management. And finally, satellite linked telemetry has provided important data to inform and better focus for conservation of Franciscanas. The tagging and the, the tracking results suggest patterns of habitat use and stability of residency that should be considered for management in combination with data on genetics and social patterns. Knowledge of the use of the entire water column clarifies potential interactions with net fisheries. The telemetry data have led to greatly revised thinking about the scale at which Franciscanas need to be managed and protected. So as I mentioned before, this was very much a team effort and I wanna show the members of the team here. I wish I could call them all out individually. Many of them participated with us in multiple seasons and the experience that they gained going from one season or one location to the next greatly benefited the subsequent efforts in which they were engaged. But it was a team that worked very well together. There were occasional challenges with language, but it's amazing how many of the Argentinians know Portuguese, how many of the Brazilians know Spanish, and many of them know English, we got by. And it worked out uh, much better than we could ever have hoped. And we developed a lot of long lasting friendships and collaborations that uh, hopefully will come to benefit the animals into the future. And it's all due to this guy, Pablo Bordino, for making it, for getting it started oh so many years ago. And with that, I'm ready to take questions for the panelists and ready to introduce the panelists. I'm gonna stop sharing here. And the panelists include uh, Marta Kramer from Brazil and Andy Stamper from Disney here in the US, Kristen Wilkinson from my program here in Sarasota. And did we get a, a Leo yet or has he not been able to join? Okay, it seems like this is the panel. And so with that, I think we're, we're ready to take questions. Okay, thank you, Randy, for an excellent presentation. Um, uh, at the moment, I don't know that I see any uh, questions yet in uh, the Q&A. Um, 
whether or not there are any on Facebook. But let me uh, let me just quickly ask you uh, at least one, maybe two questions here. So it, it's been some time that's passed um, since the work uh, you present there. Um, has more been done and do you have plans for additional work? We have not done any more tagging since that time. We have um, been trying to get a project started off the coast of Buenos Aires uh, since 2018. It's been funded, but uh, we lost the project leader, Pablo Bordino, during that year. And that was a huge setback for us. And by the time we were able to regroup after that, we were visited by COVID. And that has precluded us from putting international teams together since that time. But we will be putting an international team together probably later this year and involving folks from Denmark and from Mexico as well and from the U.S., people that were involved in some of the work with vaquitas over in the Gulf of California a few years ago because the capture technique will be different from what we've used before and will be similar to what was developed for vaquitas, which compete with Franciscanas for being the smallest of the cetaceans. Okay, let me ask one more question, and then uh, I see at least one question has popped up in the Q&A. So you had um, mentioned that these animals are moving um, with tidal uh, cycles, um, and you had suggested it might be due to um, movements of prey. It, um, I'm not sure what your depths didn't seem to be uh, very deep. Is it possible that they're moving uh, big, because of change, just simply change in depth with tidal cycle. Um, Marta, can I throw that question to you? Yeah, of course. Uh, so um, the areas are very shallow areas, yes. And we understand that fishing in this kind of places, they move with the tides. And for this reason, we believe that the animals move Yes, following the fishes, uh, because sometimes we can see the Franciscanas in very shallow areas. We catch them in areas with two, three meters, yes. And because of that, maybe we don't, uh, we didn't think that they move because of the, the dip. You agree, Andy? <laughs> that seems reasonable to, to me, Marta. Yeah. Okay, Teresa, do you have some uh, questions uh, coming out of the Q&A? Yes, we have several. Um, so our first okay. one is from Jeremy, Kis Jeremy Kiska, excuse me, um, saying, hi everyone, and thanks for the presentation, Randy and team. Uh, when you want to look at fine scale habitat use patterns of coastal dolphins, do you think you would rather use fast lock systems or Argos only systems uh, to have sufficient resolution? Yeah, that's a great question. Great question, Jeremy. Back when we were doing this, the fast lock system wasn't adequate to be able to work with animals this small and this quick. But we've done some testing of the, the more recent fast lock tags on bottlenose dolphins in Sarasota, and they work quite well. They're very accurate, they're able to, to get the signals out. Um, during the brief time the animals are at the surface. And I think that, that they could work well for the, the Franciscanas as well. Great, Jeremy says, thank you in the chat. Uh, we have John Lomax is wondering, uh, is the short lifespan of the Franciscana dolphins due to their small body size and high metabolic rate or is there some other explanation? Marta, as the animal expert, would you like to take that one? Nope. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> we don't have evidence that the animals have higher metabolic rates. Yes. Uh, and so we, I think we can't say anything about that. There's a, a good chance, at least in the Argentine waters, that much of it has to do with the tremendous rate of take in the fisheries down there, probably. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, uh, and Pabst is wondering, well, it says, uh, thank you, Randy, and your great team for this important work. And may we ask, with the extended length of some of your tag deployments, whether you all think you have a sense of the ranging behavior of the species across seasons? We wish we had longer deployments, and hopefully with the improved designs, we'll be able to get longer deployments. We mostly had data within a single season. In some cases, we crossed into a couple of seasons, but not enough to talk about variation within the course of an entire year. So it's, it's preliminary. The hints during the periods of time that we were able to watch the animals are that there is a very high level of residency. And certainly in Bobby Tonga, I'll let Marta talk about that. There, there is multi-year residency, but the other areas where they live, we don't have enough to say for certain across seasons. Yes. Yes, in Babitonga, we, we have uh, information that we get with uh, acoustics and visual observations. And we know that the animals have a, a larger home range on the winter and a small home range on, on the summer season, yes. But we have uh, so few animals that we tagged. And with the, the satellite tags, I think we don't have information about seasons, yes. Information comes from other kind of, of uh, strategy of meadows. How many dolphins have you monitored through photo ID now, Marta? We have around 23 animals that we recognize with a photo ID, yes. Out of a population of how many? Of 50, 60 animals. It's around 50% of the population that have marks, yes. This, I think it's the only place where we can uh, take photographs and have, have photo ID information. And it seems that around 40 or 50% of the population have marks. Very subtle marks oftentimes, but, but useful ones, yes. Yeah. Great, okay, our next question. Um, we have an anonymous question for Andy, which is wondering a little bit more about Disney's interest in the Franciscana dolphins and how you came to be part of the team. <laughs> um, actually, uh, it's an interesting thing. I, we've been working with Randy uh, for at least uh, over 20, 22 years plus, And I started working with him personally uh, on the, the Sarasota Dolphin Project. And that uh, revolved around uh, him with his international work. And, and we have a conservation fund that is interested in, uh, you know, saving animals and wildlife. And so we're able to uh, be able to fund that. But then with that, uh, we also have expertise within Disney. And uh, so we had, were able to get several people, both from animal husbandry and from veterinary expertise that, that have that uh, that we can help out and deploy. And so that's how we started the relationship with, with uh, Sarasota Dolphin Project and all the wonderful people down in Argentina and Brazil. Great. Um, okay, we have Gio Bortolato is asking, uh, do you see any evidence of interaction with other dolphin species uh, with the tagged Franciscanas in any of the three different locations? In Argentina, there is not the kind of follow-up observation work that there is possible in Bahia Bobby Tonga. So I'm, I'm going to defer to Marta for that. Yeah. Uh, yes, in Bobby Tonga, we have uh, another species with uh, resident populations is the Guiana dolphin, Sotalia guianensis. And they never were, we never saw them together. Yes, they don't farm mixed groups. And they use the same areas, but they never, uh, we never saw them together. And so we don't have any, any evidence of, of interaction with other dolphin species. And I, I will say, at least in Bahia San Blas, there are killer whales moving through the same areas where the Franciscanas are, which was a bit disconcerting as we were standing in the water. Um, but that's at least one species of cetacean that utilizes the same habitat and probably preys on Franciscanas from time to time. Yeah, but they, they are the predators, yes. 
is a, this kind of interaction. Yes, yeah, you know that France, that uh, the killer whales they feed on Francis Canada dolphins. Yes. Okay, Jessica Blackburn is wondering: um, have that, Has any genetic data been collected to show if the male-female pairings resulted in calves and/or lasted over multiple years? I'm not aware of any of that kind of follow-up information that's been possible to collect. And Marta, do you know of any? No, no, we it, don't have this kind of information. It's a great question. It would be wonderful to know the answer, but I'm afraid we don't have anything to address it. Yes, we, do, we have some evidence that, uh, any, that uh, Franciscanas are monogamic, yes. This information comes from, um, from the satellite text, yes, Randy, uh, from Argentina, some evidence, and also from some groups of animals that were uh, catched together in fishing nets, yes, and that show um, uh, some kind of, of relationship between the animals. But we don't have information, specific information of uh, parents, yes. Uh, but it's probable that we have this, this situation if this species is really monogamic. Okay, we have Aletta Hahn um, is wondering how the Franciscanas reacted during catching and handling. Andy, do you want that one? Yeah, going into the project, that was our biggest concern um, on how uh, fractious they might be. And, and they did um, they did prove to be uh, a quite uh, excitable animal. And uh, we tried, like heck, especially the first animal, to get that animal in and out as soon as we possibly could. Um, as we uh, uh, proceeded through the um, you know, capturing more animals, we, we took a little more time, just a little bit, you know, in increments farther to understand exactly how they were um, responding through physiology with the stress response. So we were able to take some blood samples very quickly, uh, again, trying to get them back in the water. Um, there, the physiology did, did stress that they were, they were in a stress mode. Um, the lactic acids were building um, the animals were responding and, uh, you know, it, it kind of reinforced that we need to work very, very efficiently on the animals to get them on, get them processed and get them back out in the water. And I think there were learnings that the animals do a lot better when they're in the water. So I think, uh, you know, going forward that, that we'll make adjustments, uh, you know, to have a pool of water on board um, and, you know, try to make them as comfortable as possible. Uh, it's really interesting. Can I say something, Randy? Sure. Yeah, about this handling. Yes, uh, recently, uh, maybe four four months ago, we found a juvenile Franciscana alive on the beach. Uh, this animal was with a piece of net, and this animal survived, probably from a, a bycatch. We don't know. Uh, and we could rescue this animal and stay with, uh, with her for, for a time. And this animal survived for a long, around uh, five hours of handling. And we, we could release this animal after that. And we don't have signs that this animal died. It's probably survived yet, uh, from this stress. And this is really interesting as yes, how this animal could survive from this situation. Uh, we have maybe two or three other situations of um, Franciscanas that arrive on the beach uh, alive and survive, survive it, yes. And um, we don't know, yes, something that we have to understand how, how they could survive in these situations. And in the capture, they are really very sensitive, yes, for the handling. And one thing that we did notice was that if they started to act up on the boat and we had concerns, once we put them back in the water, they usually calm back down again very quickly. Yeah. 
follow me. We have an additional question that's sort of related to that um, from Tainiki Joustra. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. My question is around impacts of the tags on the species. So this person is looking at tagging seals and convincing third parties that tagging is doable. Um, and so they wanted to know a little bit more about whether there was any damage recorded to individuals if tags came off, um, what happened when the tags stopped working, and were you actually going in and removing tags or just waiting for them to come off, that sort of thing. The tags are designed to fall off the animal. They are attached with a corrosible link with um, a washer and a, a nut or a screw that are of different metals, so there will be corrosion. And beyond the battery life of the tag, it should fall off of the fin. The only place that we could really observe this was in Baeda Babitonga. And what we found was that some of the, the tags in the earlier design would come off the fin by, by pulling back, by migrating through the very thin tissue in the trailing edge of the fin. And so part of this was due to the fact that it would collect algae and that algae would increase the drag and help to pull the tag off. But now with the more streamlined and smaller designs that we have, now with the coatings that we can put on to prevent the bio growth, uh, we do not anticipate those problems to be an issue anymore. So we did have problems with antennas breaking off and um, Marta's group was able to document tags without antennae, but we also have reinforced the area near where the antenna comes out of the tag and that is no longer the same kind of issue. So we, we think we have answers for most of these issues, but it, it's evolving all the time. And we hope that it's evolving in a unidirectional um, direction with the tags getting smaller and becoming less impactful. But we feel pretty comfortable with the version that's available now. That's wonderful. Question from Sherry Walpert, wondering, are Franciscana dolphins acoustically distinct from other species? Have there been any studies on their acoustic behavior? And Marta, that would be yours. Oh yeah, uh, we have uh, studies on acoustic behavior and they are really very distinct from other species because they are narrow band, high frequency. Uh, they produce narrowband high frequency echolocation clicks. And this is really a very uh, specific characteristic, yes. We have very few species of cetaceans that have this uh, kind of, of echolocation clicks. And they produce very um, few um, uh, whistles, yes, social sounds they produce, but not very much but mainly this kind of clicks. And we have a lot of works that we are doing now with this, with this acoustics. I look forward to continuing to hear more. Uh, we have a question from uh, Randall Collins, wondering what are local attitudes about the Franciscana dolphins and have those changed over time uh, perhaps because of any commercial success of sustainability certifications for fishing. So local public attitudes and how those changed over time. I, I don't have much to offer on that, Marta, do you? Yes, we have a similar situation on, in the three countries where the Francis can uh, of course, yes, in Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. And we have, we don't have many um, strong actions, yes, to reduce the bycatch in these three countries. In the three countries, the, this species is protected, but uh, the, the most problem is the bycatch and we don't have a solution to change or to mitigate this problem, to reduce the bycatch. And we need to have more um, research on it, yes, to find the solutions and to give some options for the fishermen, how they can fish without catching the Francis cannons. But until now, this is really a big challenge and a big problem for us.
We have a follow-up question related to that from John Gonzalvo, um, wondering about regulating or reducing boat traffic. So more broadly, not only fishing, uh, has there been any kind of work to do that in any of these three different populations? I'm not aware of any activity along those lines in Argentina. More work for the future. Uh, we have another question from Jeremy Kiska, I'm wondering, um, do you have a good understanding of gillnet fishing efforts along the coastline? Um, have you attempted to investigate spatial and temporal overlap between gillnet efforts and dolphin movements using your movement data? There was a, a project in 2010 that was funded by National Geographic to look at that. And the work that we're going to be doing, hopefully this fall, that was funded back in 2018, is specifically looking at that along the open coastline where much of the artisanal fishing happens in Buenos Aires province. So we will be going out and uh, setting, putting tags on animals during the primary fishing season to be able to look at how much overlap there is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, we don't have uh, a good understanding of gillnet fishing uh, in these three countries. I think we have information for small parts of this distribution, yes. But uh, the situation is that where uh, Franciscanas are distributed along all the coast, yes. And where you have fishing uh, with gillnets uh, near the coast uh, until 30 meters of that, you will have this overlap. This is the most probable situation, yes. One of the, the things that was of interest to me was, well, first of all, Pablo Ordino was excellent at working with stakeholders and trying to engage the public and the stakeholders in the work that was being done and understand what their needs were. So when we've done the capture release work in Argentina, it has involved local fishermen and their boats. So it helps the local economy, but more importantly, it was getting the local fishermen out on the water, seeing the animals up close and personal rather than just wrapped up and dead in their fishing nets. And then they would be made aware of the follow-up information that came from these animals showing their movements and showing that they were neighbors, showing that they were fishing in the same area time and time again. It wasn't just another Franciscana from way north in FMA4 that came down. Now, these are their local residents, the same dolphins day in and day out that they were working with. And it led some of them, not all of them by any means, but it led some of them to change their fishing practices, to experiment with new ways of, of fishing that could minimize the take, and to be advocates for the animals. They would share the information with other fishermen and help it to be known within that segment of the stakeholder community. And that sort of grassroots involvement is very important. Another component of the project that we've not talked about, we would have if one of our other co-authors had been able to make it, is that of the local educational programs. Their Aqua Marina has a very active program for going into schools and talking to the public and making them aware of the Franciscanas along the coast of Argentina and the needs that they have. So it's talking about our research in isolation probably wasn't the right thing to do. I should have mentioned early on that this is a multi-focal research effort that involves uh, a lot of outreach and education as well as the research. Yeah. Yes, another situation is that um, in many places, we have small fishing boats with small nets and the fishermen catch maybe one or two Franciscanas in one year. And they don't understand that this is a problem. And really, for if, if we saw just one fisherman, this is really a low catch, but we have a lot of so small fishermen, uh, fishing boats on the coast. It is for Brazil, for example. And when we uh, count all these fishermen, then we have a lot of dead Franciscanos. Yes, we have 500, 1,000, 2,000 fishermen catching maybe one Franciscana or two Franciscanas per year. Yes, and then this is really a problem. For, but this is difficult for the fishermen to understand this, that this is a, is a problem. So. We make a really strong work with um, education, with to give information. And this year, uh, we will um, 
began a, an, a work in some fisher communities in Brazil and to test the fingers. This is a work that Pablo began in Argentina some years ago and he tested this uh, fingers, yes, as a strategy to um, reduce the backhatch. And it, this strategy shows to be uh, efficient, yes. And so we are trying now to use this in the fishing communities and to understand if this work and how the fishermen um, ac accept this, yes. And we hope that we have good results in the next future. Well, that seems to me like a pretty good stopping point with a positive message for future work and future efforts. Um, unless there are any further questions, that's all of our Q and A. Uh, unless any one of our panelists have anything else that they want to add. No, just that we really appreciate the opportunity to share our work and share knowledge about these little animals. Great. Well, we are at four o'clock, so we've taken a full uh, complement of time in uh, question and answer session. Um, Randy, I thank you for the presentation. Andy, Marta, and Kristen, thank you for being willing to also participate in the uh, Q&A afterwards, um, I really like this model. So we might see if the opportunity uh, avails for it to happen again. So uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, and we look forward to further work um, over the coming uh, uh, season and years ahead. So with that, I guess we'll call it an end. Thanks much, appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye all. Bye-bye all.